It's more than unmerited favor. Grace is literally the power of God working in our lives, making us holy, making us righteous. Good morning. Hey. Hope everybody had a, a real good Thanksgiving. Someone told me this morning, oh, G Jim Glacken told me this morning, he said, you guys really messed up by having the buffet the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And I thought, you know what, that's true. It's all we've been doing is eating all weekend long. So anyway, Sunday, we might just as well close down Sunday by having another love feast, right? We just have a good time together. But I just trust everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Those of you that may be watching on YouTube, we just trust that you had a great Thanksgiving. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for watching. And uh, if anybody's watching live on Ustream right now, we greet you in the name of the Lord. And we say God bless you. And we're just, we just had a good time of worship and praise and some testimonies and just have a lot of fun. Um, I want to continue uh, this morning on this long series that I've been dealing with, and I don't even know what to call this one, Matt. Coming up with titles for these messages is, is really hard for me because I'm not used to doing that kind of thing, and Matt keeps putting the pressure on me to put, bring titles to these things, you know, so I have, I'll, I'll think of something here along the way, but what we're doing is I've been ministering to you on how I pray for you. And we've gone through several parts of this. Basically, what we're doing here is we're looking at the Ephesian prayers. Um, just to give you a little heads up on this, one of the things that Emmett brought to us years ago when he first came to the church and started ministering, Emmett has a lot of experience as a teacher of the Word. Uh, he's ministered in Bible colleges in and, and Oklahoma and different things. He's traveled around the country as an evangelist and ministered in a lot of places. He traveled in a motorhome like we did for a number of years. But Emmett felt, uh, what, four or five years ago to, to throw in with us, and he's been a teacher on our staff here for, for all this time. And one of, the, one of the things, Emmett's brought many wonderful teachings and many wonderful things to our church, and I think we all are products of that. Uh, he's just been a blessing to our congregation over the years. But one of the things I think that, to me, is the most instrumental is his teaching on the Ephesians' prayers. And the reason why I say that is because much of what he has taught, I have literally seen work in my own life. And so, you know, it's one thing when, when a lot of times people will teach things, and there's a difference between teaching and actually activating those teachings and see them coming into fruition in your life. And, and this has really been of great influence on my life and ministry, and I, and I think it has, from, for many of you, as, as you likewise have come to me and, and told me that you pray the Ephesians prayers over people, uh, it comes basically down to this in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Just a real quick review. There's, there's two different sections in the book of Ephesians on these prayers. The first section is Ephesians chapter 1 beginning in verse 15. Paul says, Since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Now, you know, this is Paul praying, saying how he prays for the church in Ephesus. I pray for you constantly, and here's his prayer, number one, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight. Prayer number one give you spiritual wisdom and insight. So when you're praying for yourself or you're praying for someone else, you know, maybe you're praying for a family member and they're just not getting it, you know, or maybe they're having difficulty in their lives or maybe there's a, a problem in their marriage or there's a problem with uh, their relationships or there's, Lord knows, the different problems that people can have and you start praying for them and so oftentimes, oh, God, change them, you know, we ask you to change so-and-so. We ask you to do this for so-and-so. And, you know, a lot of that changing was done 2,000 years ago at the cross. So we're asking God to do something that he's already done. And I think a lot of times when we pray, God is sitting up there on his throne. He's, he's kind of scratching his head, and he's looking down, and he says, 
what, what are they really asking for me, you know, of me? They don't understand because I've done these things. And one of the things that we see that the, the Bible teaches us that, that people are dying, they're perishing because of their lack of knowledge. And I was thinking about that today. How many people have a lack of knowledge of the Word of God? You know? And so we don't want to do that. So what God, what Paul is saying to the, this church, he says, I pray, the first part here, the first prayer, I pray that, that God would give you spiritual wisdom and insight. And what's the reason for that? So that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Now, you may have all kinds of problems in your life. And, and all, there's not a person here that doesn't have some type of a problem in their life. All right? But I'm going to tell you something. When you understand God, like we're to understand God, guess what happens to our problems? They may not totally go away, but they begin to get diminished in our own sight. They begin to get diminished. The problems begin to, you know, you think you got a great big mountain to conquer, and by the time you're all done with it, when you understand who God really is, it's no longer a mountain anymore at all. It's just a little molehill. And I've always said this. I can handle a molehill. If I got a ground mole working in my backyard, I can go out there and stomp on that. I can take care of that. But put a mountain in my path, that's a different story. You see? And sometimes we try to attack the mountains in our lives without having a knowledge of who God really is. And so, consequently, the mountains just never seem to go away. We're still dealing with the mountains. So when we pray that God would give us that wisdom so that we would understand God better, guess what? That's a good prayer to pray. And that's a good prayer to pray for ourselves, and that's a good prayer to pray for others, you know, our other members, our brothers and sisters in the church, our family members, that our eyes would be opened, that our eyes of our understanding, that we would grow in this spiritual wisdom and insight. The second prayer is verse 18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Now, you know, there's so much there. There's so much there. And I've already, I've already preached on this stuff, you know. But I, I just, I'm going right back into it, aren't I here? You know, it's, it's just really something here. When you look at this, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. Who's light? Jesus is what? The light of the world, you see? So I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. You realize he's called us all? You see, he's called us all. And he, what, what has he called us? He calls us his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. That's you. That's you. See, the church has taught us what we have to be holy. We have to do things to be holy. What the church has failed to teach us is that the real truth of the matter is, is that God is the God who makes us holy. And we cannot be holy enough. Where do we begin? Where do we end? If you work hard at trying to be holy and righteous, guess what you're going to do? You're going to fail miserably. Why are you going to fail miserably? Because you can't do it. It's impossible for you to do. It's impossible for you to accomplish. You are never, ever, ever going to be good enough to do that. But yet we're told that, religion has taught us that, you have to do more, you have to, you have to quit doing this, and you've got to start doing this, and these, all these other things. And, and then here again, God is saying, I'm not asking that of anybody. Because when we understand God and we understand his word, what do we see? We see that what he is really saying is, I have done this already for you. Now it's all you have to do is believe. And then people say, well, what happens about our bad behavior? Well, guess what? Our bad behavior becomes less and less and less and less as we understand God. You see? It's so simple. And then thirdly, he says in verse 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power to us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. You'll never go wrong in praying for yourself or for others God, let them understand your power. Where is that power? Again, people look to God out there someplace. God is in us. God is in you. 
you see? And you make it personal, especially when you're going through these things. God is in me. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. See, God dwells within each and every one of us. So we're not calling God down. We make this mistake, oh God, we're praying up to you in heaven someplace. No, he's in us. He's as close to you as your very next heartbeat. Now that's the first section of the Ephesians prayers. The second section is found in the third chapter. And that's where we started last week. And, I, and, and we looked at this and uh, uh, we, we, we noticed down in verse 14 of chapter 3, Paul says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. And we couldn't get into this at all because of our second rule of proper Bible interpretation. The first rule of proper Bible interpretation is what? Who is it written to? Important that you understand that. Is it written to you or is it written to the Jews? Is it written to somebody else? You know? Important that you understand. The second rule of Bible, proper Bible interpretation is context. Reading it in context. The third rule is do not make doctrine out of standalone, isolated verses of Scripture. If you have six verses of Scripture say go right and one that go, says go left, you don't make a doctrine out of that one that says go left. And nine times out of ten, when you apply rule number one to that verse of Scripture, guess what? It clears it up because you'll find it wasn't written to you in the first place. All right? The fourth rule of proper Bible interpretation is don't make doctrine from directional versus of Scripture versus doctrinal versus of Scripture. Much of the book of Romans, for example, is doctrinal. But there are also places where things become directional. Paul tells people in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he said, it is wise if you never get married. If you're going to really serve the Lord, it'd be wise for you not to be married because you're bringing in a responsibility into your, into your family life. Now, I know some of you are laughing, kind of tee in this, you know, some of you husbands and wives, but seriously, he's, he makes some good sense here. He says, listen, if you're going to really serve the Lord, if you're really going to go out and do a lot of great things in the kingdom of God, what happens the moment you get married? You no longer can devote yourself to that, right? Now you have a new responsibility. You have a spouse. You have children. You have grandchildren. You have on and on and on it goes. So you're no longer able to fully do the things that maybe God would have you to do. But here's, that's directional. That's not a word from God saying, thus says the Lord, no one ever gets married anymore. You see the problem that creates and that causes? There are some churches, like for instance the Catholic Church, right? That teach that, that the priests can't get married. Well, where do they get that from? They get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. See? So what happens is, is that we make a doctrine out of a directional verse. It may be wise to stay single. But then in other places he says, listen, if you have a hard time controlling yourself and lust and all these things, get, get married. You know, by all means, get married. All right? We won't go into a whole lot of that. But I want you to see it. So that's, a, that's the four thing. That's the four things. That's the four things. The four proper rules for proper Bible interpretation. So using context, rule number two, in verse 14, he says, when I think of all this. Now hold it. We can't, we can't go into this, this third part or this fourth of Ephesian prayer yet because Paul's saying, when I think of all this. So we looked at this and said, well, what's he thinking about? Keeping context in mind. We skip up to chapter 3, verse 1. And then he says, when I think of all this again. So Paul even goes further back than just chapter 3 on dealing with all this. And so that's where we were last week talking about us being the temple of the Lord. Again, with the concept that God is in us. So you can look at actually the whole second chapter here, see, because Paul, and actually the first chapter, Paul's thinking of all this, and then he is writing these words to the church in Ephesus. So we looked at verse 19 through the end of that chapter of 2 last week. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. So we go into chapter 3. Now remember in the original writings, there were no chapter and verse divisions. The Bible it was all one letter. This was one letter that Paul wrote to the pastors, to the leaders in the church of Ephesus in Asia Minor during that day, off close to Greece. So chapter 3 then, we continue on with no chapter or verse divisions. Chapter 3, verse 1 then, again he says, when I think of all this. What is he thinking about? When I think about all that he just said in chapter 2, verses 19 through um, 22, about us being the temple of the Lord. Paul is thinking about all this, you know. And then he says, he says, when I think of all this, Paul, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now remember, who's he writing to? He's writing to Gentile believers in Jesus Christ. These are not Jews. You see, it's very important. I got into a real heated discussion again this week with somebody that said, you know, what we're preaching here is so wrong. And everything, every point that they brought up was brought up under the fact of, for instance, the Ten Commandments and all this kind of stuff. You have to keep all of that. And, and, and I, my simple question was this. Was that Old Covenant or is that New Covenant? Always look at that. You know, what, you say, well, what's the difference? Was it before the cross and Christ died on the cross? The blood was shed on the cross? Or was it after the cross? Friends, there is a big difference, and you have to understand that. We are no longer under the law. You see, that ended when Jesus Christ died on the cross. His blood was shed. He literally took his, the Bible teaches us, he took his blood, and he went to heaven itself, and there he poured his blood out upon the real mercy seat in the temple of heaven. And there God said, from that point on, he says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's what God said. That's what God said. So we have to understand, are we pre-cross or after cross? And all these things that we read and all these things that we try to make a, a doctrine out of our life and we try to hold ourselves to a certain standard, one of the first questions we should ask ourselves was, was that before the cross or after the cross? Because if it was before the cross, it was a completely different thing. You see? And we try to walk in those standards, and we're never going to make it because we're going to fail. It's impossible for us to walk there because everybody who ever walked there before failed. The Jews couldn't do it. Come on, they couldn't do it. Every year they had to sacrifice a new lamb to cover their... They could not do it. Isn't it amazing now where, where God is not asking us to sacrifice a lamb anymore every year? Why? Because the lamb was slain once. His blood was shed once for all times, past, present, and future. So take that burden. Take that monkey off your back. Because if you try to follow that old way, you're only going to end up in condemnation. You're going to fail, and then you're going to judge yourself and say, well, what a crappy Christian I am. See, I couldn't even do that right. You know? Or I'll point the finger at Joe and say, what a, what a bum of a Christian he really is because he can't do it right. Well, the fact of the matter is, neither can I. And remember this one of, the one, one of the greatest lessons that Jesus ever taught us is that when we point one finger to someone else, we have four coming back at us. See? Take out the log in our own eye before we try to take the sliver out of our brother or sister's eye. Come on. It sets us free. And the only way you can do that is under grace. The only way. Because as soon as you try to be, and you start to, you turn it into judgmentalism, and you turn it into unforgiveness, and man, that stuff will eat your lunch. People get sick, they die over that stuff, it just is not a real pretty picture. So, here is, <laughs> thank you, Emmett, here is Paul saying, he says, listen, this is, this is the where it is. He says, when I think of all this stuff, 
And he says, I, I, assuming by the way that you know, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. Verse 3, as I broke, briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to us. Now, I, I sometimes like to talk about the mystery, the great mystery. And most of us are mystery people. We like mysteries, right? Mystery movies, we like reading mystery novels, different things. And, and there's this great mystery. The great mystery is found, and the answer to the great mystery, and I mentioned it earlier on, is in Galatians 1.27, Christ in us is the hope of glory. That's the great mystery. The great mystery of all eternity is somehow Jesus Christ. Jerry, Jesus lives in you. He lives. The moment you put your faith in him, Christ came in, you know. We don't understand. I can't describe that, but it's a fact. And, and, you know, there again, you don't have to look to God out there someplace. He's in you. He's as close to you as your very next heartbeat. He will, that's why he says, he says I'll never leave you nor forsake you. H how can he do that? Because he's in us. See, so many people are trying to find God. If I do this enough, if I pray enough, if I go to church enough, if I put enough money in the offering bucket or, you know, on and on and on, if I'm, if I'm a good enough little doobie, whatever it might be, you know, and I'm trying to measure up, then God, I'm going to find God, I'm going to be in the presence of God. That's what religion teaches us. They fail to teach us the truth that he's always there. You're never, never, never outside of the presence of Almighty God. Now you might say, but I don't feel that all the time. Well, Guess what? Who said you're supposed to? Because it goes beyond feelings. We all love those times when we can feel the presence of God, like Gary was talking about there when he's broke down on the side of the road, you know? And all of a sudden, the, coming, the presence of God's all over him. But the fact of the matter is, is guess what? He was just as close to God two days before that even happened, you know? You're just as close to God. Guess what? If you're down depressed in the mully grubs, you're just as close to God as Gary was that night on the road when he started getting holy laughter and all those things started hitting him. That's the fact. It's not based upon our feelings. It's based upon the truth of God's word and our faith in that Bible. You know, It's in our faith in what he said. Oh, this stuff just eats my lunch. I just get so excited with it. You know, I just... I just can't stand it because it just, it just, it's changed me so dramatically, you know. It's no longer trying, trying, trying. For years and years as a pastor, I had to work hard. I had to measure up. You know, I had to, I had to have certain results if I was going to consider myself successful. And none of that applies any longer. I, my success is knowing who I am. Just simply knowing who I am. I am, guess what? I am a holy and righteous person. And I don't care what I do. It doesn't change the fact. I'm still a holy and righteous person because that's what God says I am. That's who he says I am. He's made me that way. Verse 4 again. As you read what I've written to you, you'll understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to, be, to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news are, now listen to this, both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace, here we go, by God's grace. Now what is the definition of grace? We Most of us have been taught to believe that grace is God's unmerited favor. And that's good, but it's not good enough. That's what we've been taught. It's God's unmerited favor. And, you know, there's a truth of that. It just simply means that there's nothing I can do to earn this. He loves me anyway. You see, God is so full of love, we just cannot understand it. We cannot, we understand love like this. He understands love like that. You know, I mean, it's just completely different. But his grace is unmerited favor. Indeed, it is. There's nothing we can do to earn it. He loves us in spite of us, you know. 
But the, the real truth of the matter is this, that it's more than unmerited favor. Grace is literally the power of God working in our lives, making us holy, making us righteous. That's what that grace is. So here's what he says. You know, he's talking about this grace. Verse 7, by God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in all its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now look at this, verse 12. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Now, we're, we're going to end here with this. But we're going to end with this entire thought. But I want you to see this because this will literally transform your life if you once get a revelation of it. If you just have a head knowledge of it, you just studied this in Bible school or, or in Sunday school or at your mom's knee or something like that, you know, and you don't really have a revelation of it, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. But if you get a revelation of this, it's very, very powerful. Look at this. Because of Christ and our faith in him. Two things. But how many know he does it all, we just do that little bit, right? Because of Christ and our little bit of faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Boldly and confidently into God's presence. That's powerful, folks. That's literally powerful. And when we can understand that, it'll, again, it'll transform our lives in ways that we have never thought before. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. I mean, I have that underlined, highlighted little stars and asterisks around it. That's, that's probably one of the most important verses in the Bible. Siri not available. Where is she? Did she go on vacation, Marcia? Yeah, sure. Yeah, she's in shape. Get saved, Siri. <laughs> because, of our, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. I think the bottom line here is just don't lose faith. Don't lose hope, folks. And I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you're dealing with. Don't lose hope. And the reason why I say that is because of Christ and our faith in him, we are boldly in the presence of God. A God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting eternal life. That's the God we serve. So maybe next week <laughs> we might be able to get into this fourth Ephesians prayer. But you see, I could not just do that and negate all of this, this wonderful meat that's found in these verses of Scripture. And I hope it just, in, just intrigues you with the book of Ephesians. I, people sometimes say, well, I, you know, I'm all excited. Let, let me, I want to start reading my Bible. How should I read my Bible? Well, first of all, let me just tell you this. If you're a young believer, you're real young, you know, anybody that might be watching, here's a tip for you. But if you're a young believer, stay out of the Old Testament. Don't, don't get in there. You don't understand it. You won't understand it until you get a hold of what we're teaching you here. Then you can understand the history of it because it all points to this, but not for you to live there, for you to live here on this side of the New Covenant, this side of the cross into New Covenant land, see? Religion will keep you back in the old, but we want to be in the new. That's where 
That's where the blessings are. That's where the whole concept of everything that God has for us is there for us, for you and I. So understand this. Get a hold of the book of Galatians. Get a hold of Romans. Get a hold of Ephesians, especially those first few chapters in Ephesians. Get a hold of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Understand those epistles. Understand what Paul wrote to the church. You say, well, why is that important? I've, one person asked me one time, do you preach anything other than Paul's writings? Well, we do, but it's very important that we understand that Paul was the first of all the apostles to get this, and he brought it back. And so all you have to do is read Galatians chapter 1 to verify this. But Paul was the very first of all the apostles to get this revelation of new covenant grace. And Jesus taught it to him himself. Paul was out on the Arabian desert for a period of three years. He met Jesus, taught him this stuff. He says in Galatians 1, he says, these words that I teach you, they're not of words of man. These are words of, from Jesus Christ himself. And so he brought this back to Jerusalem, back to the other disciples. And, you know, like, for instance, some people say, well, like the book of James. The book of James says some things. The book of James was the first New Testament book written. The book of James was written before Paul had the revelation of grace. So James later embraced what Paul brought, but, you know, James didn't understand grace at the time the book of James was written, and so you, you know, have to understand some of these things. But Paul brought that in. So study these, these teachings of Paul. Study what he has written to the church and, and place them into, into activity in your life and you'll begin to see a lot of wonderful, awesome truth transpire there. So I am still without a title to my message, Mr. Matthew. So I leave it to you, my brother, as you do this marvelous job of editing, and I dump this whole responsibility onto you. And he does such a good job, I'm sure he will come up with something that will dazzle us. Yeah, no, no. So, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord. Golly, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that we're so free. We thank you for the grace, and we thank you for all of these things. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We're not isolated from you. We're with you. You're with us. And we just praise you for that right now, and we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we especially lift up those that may be watching this morning. And, you know, I don't know what you're going through. Sometimes we hear from you, and you tell us all kinds of stories, and, golly, some of these things are really rough. But you know what? I want you to know we love you, and we care for you, and we just believe that God's grace is for you as well. And as of this minute, you see, you're a part of us. If you're still listening, if you're still watching this video, you're a part of us right now. We include you in this. And so we say, God bless you all, and we thank you in Jesus' name.